Isn't it good to come out of the uh, chill this morning? <laughs> Feel uh, two kinds of warmth. Warmth of uh, the heat and the warmth of the Lord from our common fellowship with Christ. Well, greetings, everyone. In the trustworthy name of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has taken away our sin. My name is Rob Smith, and together with all of our church family here and all those watching from home, let's remember the words from Acts, book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, where we are told, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. We would love to get to know you better. We have a time of fellowship, uh, typically outside. It's a little bit of a test, but it's a time to get closer, and the cold temperatures only make us appreciate the warmth of fellowship all the more. And we hope you will be able to stay around a bit so we can speak with you and get better acquainted. We also have a guest table at the back of the sanctuary, and there's someone there following the service to uh, answer any questions you might have to get you signed up for the uh, email that our church puts out midweek every week with announcements and important information. Make sure you sign up for that email if you're not already getting it. And there will be someone there to help you after the service again. Important announcement for members. uh, There is today at 4 p.m., 4 p.m. today, a Zoom-based members meeting. And it's going to cover important matters in the life of our church, most especially The elders will be interviewing our elder candidate, Adam Messer, and we may also vote on Adam to serve as an elder during that meeting. If you are a member of uh, Christ Fellowship, please do plan to be present for this important meeting. And if you did not receive the email that went out yesterday, uh, the emailed invitation to the Zoom meeting, which has the link to click on and all that, uh, please get in touch with Ron Stoll. I think Ron's over here. And Ron can get you the uh, meeting information, the Zoom information, and all that, so that you can get on the meeting. Okay, let's take a moment now and just quiet our hearts as we seek God's blessing on our service this morning. And then I'll read Psalm 110. Psalm 110, a psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, how mysterious is your love and your plan. We have gone our own way. We have lived in outright rebellion to you, living for ourselves, blindly chasing false hopes. And yet you reached out to us and offered us the one true and certain hope, life eternal, made, re- made real for us through the payment for our sins by your only son. How great is our salvation. And we would not have known you if you had not come to us and opened our hearts and minds to realize our separation from you and our need for the Savior. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We commit ourselves to praise you today and to renew our commitment to live for you. Please fill our hearts with joy now as we express our gratitude in singing. Sharpen our minds to hear your spirit as the word is shared. And let us not forget what we learn and let us be changed this morning more and more, to be like Christ. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Christ Fellowship. Let's stand and uh, sing praises to our Lord this morning with living hope. I believe it's a new song that you learned last week. <laughs> 
is no clay. 
seated. And as you're seated, Ron Stowe will come up and read from Isaiah 53. God's word as spoken through his prophet Isaiah. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, whom considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. God's word. Let's stand again and continue singing this morning with I will glory in my Redeemer. I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed. 
Well, it's wonderful to sing about the power of the cross, isn't it? And to be reminded that it's the power of the cross that has set us free from sin and death and hell, making us new in Christ. It's this Christ who is our Redeemer, our Elder Brother, our Advocate, our High Priest, the one that we can go to in prayer. Let's go to him in prayer now. Let's pray. Lord God, we rejoice to be able to come into your presence this morning. It's good to be with your people. It's good to know that you are with us by your spirit, that you're here to be worshipped and to be praised and to help us, God, because it's our heart's desire to praise you this morning. Lord, we praise you with joy this morning because you have given us a great and eternal salvation. We possess it now. Eternal life has already been given to us now 
And because you are guarding us through faith, we will surely inherit that salvation. And we praise you for that this morning. Lord, we praise you that you have a plan of salvation that you've been working out through history. Lord, in the Old Testament, you sent forth men, prophets, who would tell us about a coming Messiah, one who would be a king and a savior, one who would be cut off, one who would be afflicted, one who would die so that we might live. And then in the fullness of time, you sent forth your son, the Lord Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law to fulfill the law in our place so that we might be redeemed, so that we might be saved. And he, he was cut off. He gave himself freely as a sacrifice on the cross. He died, but then he rose from the dead. And we gather this morning with joy in our hearts because just as he has been raised, so we will be risen. By faith, we have entered into this great salvation, and we praise you for that this morning. We praise you for the matchless wisdom and power that it displays for the reality that it is in our lives. But God, when we think about your salvation, when we think about the majesty of your plan, we confess that that our hearts are often hard. It amazes us that we can talk about these kind of things, but, but at times we're unmoved. Uh, it's almost like these truths have become commonplace. Of course we know this. Of course we know that Jesus died, but we don't meditate deeply on the reality of what that means, of the significance of his, of his suffering in our place so that we would never know your wrath, of the majesty of your justice display that you would that you would punish sin because you are good and holy, but you would spare the sinner. You would spare us. Lord, we're, we're often just so caught up looking at the fluff and baubles of this passing life that we don't take the time we should to meditate on these truths. And we confess that as foolish, and we confess it as a lack of love this morning. And Lord, we know that the only hope we have to love you in the way you deserve to be loved is that your spirit would give us your love more and more. And so even now we pray for that. Lord, we thank you that you're perfect in patience this morning. It's good to thank you for who you are. It's good to thank you that, that you know our frame, that you remember that we are dust, that you're mindful of our weakness and you don't despise us, but instead in mercy and compassion, you move towards us, giving us everything we need so that we do not grow weary, so that we do not give up in this race that we're in, but instead we continue to press on, and we thank you for that. We thank you that you aren't exasperated with us. We thank you, Lord God, that you are satisfied with the work that Christ has done and with the work that you're doing within us this morning. We thank you for the hope we have that you will complete the good work that you've begun. And so we don't have to be afraid this morning because we're not ultimately looking to ourselves to save ourselves. We're looking to you, the one who has promised to fulfill, to complete this good work. And we thank you for that. Lord, we want to pray for the nations of the world this morning. We pray for the nation of Armenia, three, uh, three million people, many of whom are nominally Orthodox, but to them, Christianity is a tradition. It's rituals. It's do this and don't do that. They don't have a real relationship with Jesus. They don't understand the gospel. And so we pray for this nation, asking, Lord God, that you would work. We thank you that there are many evangelical churches in Armenia. We thank you for the way that you have used uh, believing Armenians all around the world to invest in this nation so that there is a growing evangelical population that loves Christ, that understands the cross, and is sharing it with others. And we pray, Lord God, that you would move there. We pray, Father, that you would help this nation, which has known so much poverty uh, and so much warfare and so much conflict and strife, find peace in Christ. Lord, you tell us to pray for those who are in high positions of authority over us, and we want to pray also for those who are in positions of influence. And so we pray this morning for the school board of James City County, for those that have been elected to those positions that have a responsibility to care for the children of this community. We pray particularly for, for the chairman of that board, for Jim Kelly. And we thank you for him, and we thank you for his family. We pray that you would give him and the other members of that board great wisdom as they navigate these difficult circumstances. Uh, we pray that it would be in their hearts to do what's best for the children. We pray that our children would receive a good education, a real education. And we pray that you would use Jim and others to help in that. Bless them. Give them wisdom. Lord, we pray for Grace Baptist Chapel this morning. Thank you that there are many churches in our area, in our community, that preach your gospel. And we thank you for Pastor Ryan Davidson and the work that he's done there for many years now. Lord, I, 
praise you for his faithfulness to your word and his love for your word. And as he's asked to pray, asked us to pray this morning in particular, that the word would be honored as it's preached and that the people would grow in their knowledge and love of it and that they would grow in their hospitality towards one another and others. We pray that you would do that good work there. And we pray not only for them, but we pray that you'd do that good work in us as well. Help us to know your word more. Help us to love your word more. And make us increasingly a hospitable people, a people who reflect your character. Lord, we pray for our church. Uh, We pray that you would provide us with a new church building. Father, we pray that you would open the door at just the right time, that we would be able to gather together as one body, as one church. And Lord, we're looking to you to provide that. We thank you that your wisdom is great. We thank you that your time is perfect. But we do pray for that. You tell us to ask great things. We're asking for a great thing. Asking God that you would provide us a space that would enable us to worship you as one body when the time is right. Lord, we pray also in particular for the elders today. We pray that you would give wisdom to them. Uh, Lord, we pray that you give wisdom as we are in the search for a pastor for discipleship. Lord, we're praying that you would bring just the right man to this role that would cause the ministry of this church to flourish. Lord, we pray that you would provide for him and his family even now. Uh, We pray that you would give wisdom as we're in the middle of this search and that you'd make us a prayerful people at this time. It's such a pivotal time in the life of our church. And so we pray for your help in that. We pray in a particular way for Adam Messer. Uh, As we consider him to be an elder in our church, Lord God, we pray your blessing on him, on his family. Uh, We pray, Father, that you would give us wisdom as a church uh, to know how to proceed there. We pray for Adam and Carrie, that you would just cause your spirit to fill them more and more, that they would love you more and more and continue the good service that they are doing among us. And Lord, as we think about your word this morning and what we'll be meditating on as we look at 1 Peter together, we pray that you would help us to be a church that thinks deeply about the riches, the treasure that we have in the gospel that we'd understand what a treasure Christ is, uh, that we would think about it, that we would meditate on it, that we would understand its worth, that it would be a treasure to us. And God, only you can do that by your Spirit. So we, com- we pray that you would come and do that among us this morning, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'd ask you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be looking at verses 10 to 12. So as you get your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, please stand with me out of respect for God's Word, and we will read this passage. I'll read and ask you to follow along as I read. Concerning this salvation... The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Amen. This is God's word for us this morning. Please be seated. As I thought about this passage this week and read it over and looked at it, it occurred to me that what we're seeing here is we're seeing the worth of the gospel, we're seeing the worth of the salvation that we have received, and one of the ways you see that is is by the way that these Old Testament prophets are meditating on and thinking about the Messiah, God's plan of salvation. And it's, it's true that we think about what's important to us, right? The things that we value, we tend to think about those things. So think about your finances, You know, if you value your financial situation, you'll take the time to plan well. You'll look at your bank accounts. You'll look at your retirement accounts. You'll make sure that your financial plan is working well, right? Many of our young people are kind of in this point of transition in their lives where they're thinking about the future. As they think about the future, they want to plan well, and so they're thinking about it a lot, making various plans, perhaps applying to schools or applying to jobs, praying, but it's definitely on their mind as they're thinking about their future because they value it. If you're married and you value your spouse, you're going to think about him or her during the day, right? It won't only be when you see them, but even while you're working, they'll come into your mind and perhaps you'll give them a phone call or perhaps you'll pray for them just as you're working because they're important to you. And we do know as those who follow Jesus, as those who have a relationship with God, that if our relationship with God is important to us, it's going to be always on our mind. We're going to keep the thought of God in front of us as we go through our day.
And if we don't do that, if God is often far from our thoughts, it means that our relationship with him isn't as important as it should be. Again, we think about what we value, and I I believe that's what we're seeing here in this passage. That's what Peter is pointing us to. He's pointing us to the worth of our salvation, and the way he does that is by talking about the Old Testament prophets who knew that this salvation was coming, who knew that God was going to send a Messiah, and they didn't just receive that and move on with life, but instead they inquired into it. They thought about it deeply. They meditated on it because it was was significant to them. They valued God's salvation, and so they really thought about it deeply. So this is a passage that can teach us about the preciousness of the gospel, can teach us about the the greatness of the salvation that we have received in Christ. And it's so important for us to have passages like this throughout the scripture, because if you're anything like me, you can very easily get distracted by this life and by the things of this world and by busyness and by troubles and by stress. And before you know it, we're so fixed on what's happening in our lives, we're forgotten about the fact that we have Jesus, a Savior who is precious to us, a Savior who's rescued us. So this passage can help us to think about Jesus this morning. We're continuing our study in 1 Peter. Uh, We've been looking at this first section of the book from verses 3 to 12 over the past three weeks. So two weeks ago, we looked at verses 3 and 5, or 3 to 5, and we thought about the living hope that we have received. So we have a living hope as opposed to a dying hope that many of the people around us have. Our living hope is this, this inheritance, an eternal inheritance in Christ that we will receive one day, that we will surely receive. And we know that we will receive this inheritance because God is guarding us through faith for that inheritance. He's keeping us believing. He's keeping us enduring. Last week, we talked about our trials from verses 6 to 9, and we thought about suffering and how suffering relates to Christians, how we should think about the suffering that we experience. We were, were reminded that God has good purposes for his people's suffering that it's not happenstance, that it's not willy-nilly, that it's not meaningless, but God has particular and good purposes for the trials that he brings into our lives. And we were also reminded that Jesus is a present help for his suffering people. And that's a sweet thing to think about. No matter what we lose in this life, we always have Jesus. He's always with us even as we suffer. Well, we're going to be looking at verse 10 to 12 this morning. And again, we're thinking about the value of salvation here Peter points us to the example of the Old Testament prophets who were longing to know more about the salvation. They understood it was coming. The Holy Spirit was testifying within them and giving them prophecy, and they valued it, so they spent time thinking about it. And Peter also points us to to this reality, that as those who follow Jesus, we enjoy great spiritual privileges. So we're going to look at both of those truths this morning. So two points from verses 10 to 12. If you're taking notes, they're kind of long, but hopefully you got the sheet and you'll be able to just kind of take notes underneath them. Well, the first point is that the desire of the Old Testament prophets to understand God's salvation shows us the worth of our salvation. We'll see that in verse 10 to 11. And then the second point, those who have received God's salvation are spiritually privileged. And we'll see that as we look at verse 12 together this morning. Let's look at that first point, the desire of the Old Testament prophets to understand God's salvation shows us the worth of our salvation. Look at your copy of God's Word, verse 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. In verse 9, if you look up just a little bit in your copy of God's Word, you see that Peter had been talking about how Christians are obtaining the outcome of their faith, the salvation of their soul. And he was talking about the relationship that we have with Jesus, and it's a real relationship. It's a relationship that gives us joy. It's a relationship that we can grow in our trust in him and that we can love him. And so as we continue on in our relationship with Jesus, we experience that salvation more and more. We can grow in our depth of trust and our depth of joy and our depth of love for the Lord Jesus. He's talking about this process of sanctification of the Christian life, this salvation that we have now received. But of course, there was a time before Christ came when this joy that we now experience in the salvation that we have received, well, it didn't exist because Christ had not come. That's what Peter's talking about in verse 10. He points us to the desires of the Old Testament prophets who were living before Christ. And before Christ came, what were these prophets doing? Well, they were searching 
and they were inquiring into this salvation. That's what Peter says in verse 10. Again, look at verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Those words, search and inquired, it doesn't just talk about thinking about it from time to time. It talks about a diligent searching out. They were looking into these things deeply with the greatest care. They knew the Messiah was coming, they knew that through the Messiah, God would send this long-awaited salvation that they had, they had learned about and heard about and been hoping in. And because they knew the worth of this salvation, they thought about it. They meditated on it. They searched it out carefully. What were they specifically searching out and inquiring into? Well, look at verse 11. Peter tells us there, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Really, the Old Testament prophets were looking into their own prophecies, these words of truth that the Holy Spirit had given them to proclaim this coming Christ, this coming Messiah. They wanted to know more about the Messiah. They wanted to understand what the Holy Spirit meant when he was predicting the sufferings of the Messiah. They wanted to understand what the Holy Spirit meant when he was predicting the glories that would come to the Messiah and to his people because of those sufferings. And as you read through the Old Testament, you'll see that it's filled with these prophecies, both of the suffering of the Messiah and of the glories that would come to the Messiah and his people as a result of his sufferings. So just think about what you know of the Old Testament. The first prophecy of the suffering of the Messiah is found at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where we're told that the seed of the woman is going to have his heel bruised. And it's a picture of suffering. It's a picture of the suffering that Jesus would ultimately experience on the cross. And then many of us are familiar with Psalm 22. It's a psalm that talks about the emotional anguish of the Messiah, and not just the emotional anguish, but also the physical anguish that he would experience as he was dying on the cross. Perhaps the clearest prophecy of the suffering of the Messiah is the one that we read earlier in the service from Isaiah 53. Ron read that for us. It's this it's just majestic, amazing prophecy. Let me read just verses 4 to 6 for you again. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here, this prophecy doesn't only tell us about the sufferings of the Messiah, but it, it explains why the Messiah had to suffer. You see, he had to suffer for us. He had to suffer in our place. He had to pay the penalty for our sins so that we might become righteous in him. And just consider that this prophecy was, was spoken some 700 years before Jesus came and fulfilled it in history. It is amazing, God's plan of redemption, as he works it out and tells his people about it before it happens. But, of course, the Holy Spirit didn't only inspire these Old Testament prophets to, to prophesy about the sufferings of Christ. They also prophesy about his glory. So Psalm 2 tells us that the Messiah is going to inherit all the nations, going to rule over all. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, picture the Son of Man, this Messiah figure who's coming before the throne of glory, and to him is given dominion over all the nations of the world. Again, here you have glory coming out of his suffering. And in Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, tells us that the Messiah would come in glory and he would purify his people. Now we would be pure, that we would be holy, that we would enter into this glory in that way. Now these are just a few of the places in the Old Testament where you can see the sufferings of Christ and his subsequent glories. But really, as you read through the Old Testament, be looking for it because it's everywhere. There are dozens and dozens of these prophecies pointing to the Messiah. So how did the Old Testament prophets respond to this reality that God was revealing all of this truth? Well, they searched out these prophecies diligently. Peter says they were inquiring into what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating so their, their interest most especially was on the person of Christ, this Messiah, the anointed one, the coming king, the one who would accomplish all of this glory for his people through suffering. They were consumed with knowing more about the salvation of God. And so listen, they thought about it. They meditated on it. They spent time thinking about what God was doing 
John MacArthur put it this way. He said, they sought to know more precisely what person would come as savior, judge, prophet, priest, and king, and during what season or era that coming would occur. Now, I think one of the clearest places in the Bible where you see kind of this intense longing that the Old Testament prophets had to understand who the Messiah was and when he was going to come is found in the life of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, was a, he was a remarkable figure. He was a striking personality. You know, he's dressed in camel's hair. He's got a leather belt. He's eating honey and locusts. He's kind of a, an odd individual, and yet when he spoke, he spoke with the authority of God, and, and people just flocked to him to hear him and he had one pressing concern, and what was that? It was to prepare the way for the Messiah, right? That was his ministry. That was his mission, was to prepare the way for the Messiah. But John was not a fearful man. He was not a timid man. He was willing to speak against immorality. Brothers and sisters, something we're going to have to be willing to do in our day, which is to speak against immorality. He did so. He spoke against Herod, who was the king, and his adulterous marriage to his sister-in-law, Herodias, and he ended up in prison as a result. But what was he doing in prison? Was he concerned about himself? Was he fearful because he was facing death? Well, no, we actually learned what he was doing in Matthew chapter 11. What does he do? He sends his disciples to Jesus, who's also ministering, and he asks Jesus this question, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Here, he's not consumed with himself. He's not consumed with his own suffering. He's not interested in that. What's he interested in? He wants to know, is Jesus the Messiah? Is this long-awaited Messiah finally here? And of course, Jesus answers, not only in words, but by performing miracles, showing that he is indeed the Messiah who would come. And Jesus pointed his disciples to this same reality, that they were experiencing something that the Old Testament prophets and righteous saints wanted to see He says this in Matthew 13, verses 16 to 17. He says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Now, there's a lot we could say from this, but I want us just to kind of make two observations from this before we move on. The first observation is that the the desire of the Old Testament prophets to understand God's salvation shows us the worth of of our salvation. And brothers and sisters, we need to be reminded of it because we're forgetful. It's a remarkable thing. I mean, many of us who've grown up in the church, we've, we've been hearing about Jesus and the cross and salvation our entire lives. We went to Sunday school, which is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing to learn these stories, but they can become just stories. And so you know about it, and it becomes commonplace And so you don't actually think about it. You don't actually meditate on it. You don't actually value it in the way that you should. Tragically, sin works in our heart this way. Sin makes us bored with God, right? Our sin makes us bored with God. It makes us bored with eternal realities. The the fluff of this world seems so much more shiny in the moment. So sin works that way in our hearts. But here we see something in the zeal of these prophets to understand God's salvation. It shows us that our salvation isn't cheap. It shows us that it's not commonplace, that it's a precious thing. It's a precious reality. It certainly isn't boring. So the the prophets, they lived in a time when the only hope for atonement, for the forgiveness of sins, was sacrifice, right? They had to take an animal to the temple to atone for their sins. They, They didn't have direct access to God for forgiveness. Instead, they had to go to a priest, and the priest would offer a sacrifice in their place. And and these, these prophets and these godly Israelites, they felt their sin and they longed for their Redeemer. You hear Job talking about that when he says, I know my Redeemer lives, right? They're hoping in this coming redemption. Their salvation was their hope, and so they searched into it diligently. And so the question for us this morning is looking at the way they valued the salvation that God would bring, do we, brothers and sisters, value the salvation that we have now received? Do we understand what it is that we have received in Christ? And I think the answer is, you're for, if you're a Christian, the answer is yes. By God's grace, we understand it, but none of us understand it the way we should. None of us understand it as deeply as we should. None of us are moved as much as we should be emotionally to think about the fact that the eternal Son of God would leave glory and come into this world in order to rescue rebels. And that's who we were. We were rebels against his glory. So, brother, sister, when was the last time you thought about your salvation? When was the last time that you meditated on Christ's sufferings on the cross so that you would never have to endure the wrath of God? 
right? Have you ever read a book on the atonement? Just set aside time to really think deeply about what the atonement is, what Christ was doing when he was reconciling us to God through his death. There's a great book called The Cross of Christ by John Stott. I'd recommend it to you that you would read it and meditate on this great work of Christ. Have you memorized portions of Scripture that, that just talk about the glory of the gospel, the glory of Christ, what it is that he has achieved for us? I think of verses like Romans 1, 16 and 17, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There are wonderful verses of Scripture that we can memorize and meditate on and think about, and they will speak to us about the worth of the salvation that we have received. If, brother or sister, if you're not doing it, now's a great time to begin doing it. Like today, like this afternoon, is a, a wonderful opportunity just to kind of open God's Word and read and think and meditate on what God has done for you in Christ So these Old Testament prophets, they demonstrated the worth of our salvation, how? By thinking about it, by meditating on it, by searching into it. We who have received this salvation will will demonstrate that we value our salvation in precisely the same way. And friends, I'm just like you. It's so easy to be distracted, isn't it? There's a million things to do in the course of a day, but we have the privilege, privilege each day of spending time with Jesus of thinking about what it is that he's done for us and what a good thing for us to do. There's a second observation that we should make from this. For the Christians, suffering always precedes glory. Suffering always precedes glory. We're going to see this theme actually repeated as we study through 1 Peter. Uh, It's a major theme here in this book, and remember who Peter's writing to. He's writing to believers who are beginning to suffer because they follow Jesus. Right now, they're being mocked, they're being slandered, but the persecution is going to intensify. Physical suffering is going to come. So he's preparing them for this because many were no doubt confused about this, right? If Jesus is God, if he's the king of the universe, if he's now ascended to heaven, why are those who are following him suffering? Uh, Why aren't they living their best life now? Why aren't they experiencing happiness and joy and peace and prosperity at all times? And we know that many people still think like this in our day. But one of the truths of Scripture we must understand is that if we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to walk down the same road he did. It's going to be this Calvary road that's going to begin with suffering, but it's going to end with, praise God, glory. We're going to follow this same pattern, right? The, the Old Testament prophets are looking into the sufferings of Christ and then what his subsequent glories. So the glories, they come after the suffering, and that's true for us. How did Christ go to heaven? He went to heaven by the way of the cross. So we should not expect to go to heaven on kind of flowery beds of ease, should we? No, if we're going to follow him, we know that we're going to experience some of that same suffering. Actually, Paul, Paul grew to delight in that, not for the suffering's sake itself, why? But because he knew the partnership of Christ in that suffering, because he received grace from Christ in a special way in that suffering. So if we're going to follow Jesus, the very basic command for us is that we must take up our cross and follow him, right? That's the first thing we must do. That means we must be willing to to suffer the reproach of Christ, to be shamed for following him by those who hate him. We must be willing to die to self, It's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? To day by day by day say no to me and what I want and serving myself, but instead asking myself the question, how can I serve God? How can I serve others? We've got to be willing to follow Christ in that way. All of this is part of what it means to be a Christian, but this should not be discouraging to us. Why? Because the final word here isn't suffering. What's the final word? The final word is glory. The final word is glory. It's a word that speaks of brilliance. It's a word that speaks of weight. It's this wonderful reality that after the cross comes the crown, and the crown, brothers and sisters, will last forever. In other words, the Bible tells us, and we learn from experience over time, that this life is short and eternity is long. And eternity is good for those who follow Jesus. J.C. Rowell put it this way. He said, The presence and company of Christ will make amends for all we suffer here below. When we see as we have been seen and look back on the journey of life, we shall wonder at our own faintness of heart. We shall marvel that we made so much of our cross and thought so little of our crown. 
We shall marvel that in counting the cost, we should ever doubt on which side the balance of profit lay. Let us take courage. We are not far from home. It may cost much to be a true Christian and a consistent holy man, but it pays. That's what we see there. We see that there is worth to what we've received in Christ. And one of the ways that we demonstrate the worth of that is by meditating on it, thinking about it, so that we could understand it rightly and praise God rightly for the salvation he's given us. There's a second point this morning. Those who have received God's salvation are spiritually privileged. We'll see this in verse 12. So what's Peter doing? Verse 10 and 11, he's talking about the worth of our salvation, the value of our salvation. Now in verse 12, he kind of changes the focus just a little bit, just a little bit to talk about the spiritual privileges that we have received in Christ. And he does that by highlighting the fact that our spiritual privileges as those who have received Christ's salvation now are greater than the spiritual privileges that the Old Testament prophets themselves received. And even in some ways, greater than what the holy angels of God themselves receive. It's a remarkable verse. This is what he's focusing on here. So look at what he says in verse 12. First, first part of verse 12, he's talking about how our privileges are greater than those of the Old Testament prophets. He says, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Notice he says you over and over and over. He's emphasizing the privilege of what it is that they have received and how it was that the Old Testament prophets were serving them. He's saying that the Old Testament prophets did not receive the fullness of the promise. They didn't see God's salvation through the Messiah in their time, even though they desperately wanted to. Right? They were like godly old Simeon in the temple who was waiting to see the salvation of the Lord. He was longing to see the salvation of the Lord, and then, and then he saw Christ before he died, and he rejoiced. But these Old Testament prophets, they, they didn't do it. They didn't receive that. Jesus didn't come in their lifetime. Instead, Peter says that it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you. So God let these Old Testament prophets know that their ministry wasn't ultimately for themselves, but it was for a future generation. It was for the generation that would see the Messiah come. It was for these readers, these first readers of Peter's letters he's writing in the first century and Christ's fellowship. It is for us in the 21st century. We have received now this salvation. It's a wonderful privilege. The Old Testament prophets, just think about it, they were serving us in this way. How have these Old Testament prophets served Peter's readers? How they served us? He says, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. So these Old Testament prophets served us, how? By writing down the truth, these prophecies of a Messiah who would come. And then the good news came. Why? Because Jesus, the Messiah, actually did come. And he fulfilled all those prophecies. And so we're able to point and say, listen, God promised this would happen. And now see, Christ has come and he has done all of it. See that God's word is true and see that you can be saved today if you will put your trust in Jesus, who is God's Messiah, who is the hope of mankind, who is the only savior for sinners like you and me. It's such good news. They had heard the good news. They had received the good news. They trusted in Jesus. They'd received God's salvation. And because they'd received God's salvation, they and we received greater spiritual privileges even than the Old Testament prophets. Why? Because the Old Testament prophets only saw and prophesied about them from afar. They could see it from afar, but they didn't experience it. It's true for us in that way. Like these Christians that Peter was writing to, we've received this salvation now, and so we have received these great privileges. What are our spiritual privileges that we have received that are even greater than what the Old Testament prophets did? Well, they lived in the day of promise, right? But we live in a day of fulfillment. We've actually experienced, again, the reality. We see that the salvation has been accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus all foretold, all foretold, and now we get to live in the day of fulfillment. We're witnesses to that truth. The Old Testament prophets most especially had the, the privilege of pointing to the Messiah, of saying the Messiah is coming, put your hope in him, the Messiah is coming. We have exactly the same privilege, but now we have the ability to do it even better than they did. How? We can point people to Jesus and say, see, he was prophesied in the Old Testament, and he came, and he fulfilled all of these prophecies. He died on the cross for sinners. Friend, put your trust in Jesus today, 
and be saved. What a privilege to talk about the fulfillment of all of these prophecies. What a privilege to know that it has been done. The Old Testament prophets couldn't have a personal relationship with the Messiah because he hadn't come yet. You and I, as we talked about last week, we know Jesus. So again, being a Christian isn't being a nice moral person who does these things and doesn't do these things and we're a nice religion. It's not that. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We love him. We trust in him. We rejoice in him. We know Jesus as our prophet, as our priest, as our king, as our elder brother, as our intercessor, as our advocate, as our peace, as our righteousness, and so much more. They knew about the Messiah. They didn't have a relationship because he hadn't come yet. By God's grace, we have this relationship. Paul lists all the privileges of being a Christian in Ephesians 1. We, we have a holy and blameless standing before God in Christ. What good news if you came to church this morning feeling shame because you had a bad week? What good no, news to know that you have a holy and blameless standing in Christ this morning because that's been given to you as a gift of God's grace. We have the adoption of sons and daughters of God. It would be an amazing thing to be a servant of God, but he's made us sons and daughters in Christ. We have God's glorious grace at work in our life. We have the forgiveness of all of our sins. We have redemption from slavery to sin and to Satan. Best of all, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit. God himself has has chosen to take up residence in our hearts to make us new. An amazing privilege. It's an amazing privilege to be a Christian. So we have greater privileges in many ways than these Old Testament prophets, but it's not just the Old Testament prophets. Peter goes on in the second part of verse 12 to talk about the fact that we have greater spiritual privileges in some ways than even the angels of God themselves. Peter says, things into which angels long to look. Well, what are the things that angels long to look into? Well, they are the the things that have been announced to those or through those who preach the good news. In short, it's the gospel. They're looking into this message of salvation, this reality of salvation. They want to see the way that Jesus fulfilled these Old Testament prophecies. They want to see the work that he has done on the cross and in his resurrection. And they want to see the work that he is doing in the lives of those who follow Jesus. You see, they're witnesses to all that God is accomplishing through the gospel. And Peter tells us that this desire, the desire of these angels, it's not a passing curiosity, right? It's not that. The word he uses, is a, it's a verb, it's epithemeo. It's, it's a verb that speaks of a strong, powerful, kind of almost a controlling desire, right? They are intensely fascinated by God's salvation. They want to know everything they can about it because with holy eyes, they're able to see the glory. They're able to see the glory of what God has done. But here's the thing. While angels can learn about God's salvation, they can't experience it. They're holy. They don't know what it is to be a sinner. And so they don't know what it is to receive grace and mercy from a holy, gracious, and merciful God. They can look on salvation from the outside. That's really the idea of the word look there. It's to look from the outside. It's used in John chapter 20, verse 11 of of Mary, when she kind of stoops to peer into Jesus' tomb, right? After Jesus is raised. She doesn't go into the tomb. She's stooping and looking into the tomb. It's a good picture. You see, because these angels can look into salvation, they can study it, but because they've never sinned, they can't know it experientially, They can't experience the grace of God in this way. So as amazing as it sounds, Christians enjoy some spiritual privileges that are even greater than what the angels of God enjoy. Angels can see and study the gospel. We can taste and see the goodness of God. It's a great thing. Angels know what it is to be holy. We know what it is to be sinful and to feel the perfect acceptance of God towards sinners. The book of Revelation indicates that angels will even sing about this salvation, but they won't be able to sing about it the same way we will when we stand around the throne of God and praise him for his work of grace in our lives. Looking at verse 12, you see that the Christians enjoy these great spiritual privileges, greater than Old Testament prophets, greater in some ways even than the very angels of God. The Old Testament prophets saw God's grace from afar, The angels of God gaze on the grace of God from the outside, but you and I experience it. You and I 
feel it. We taste, we see. So let me make three just kind of applications as we conclude the sermon this morning. The first application is for you, friend, if you've never been saved. I hope you see, as you've been listening, that the Bible is not just a book of kind of religious quotations and nice thoughts that are put together by religious people about God and what God must be like. It contains the very story of redemption. It tells us God's plan from beginning to end about how sinful people like us can be restored. It tells us about these prophets who came to speak forth these true prophecies. It tells us about the Messiah Jesus who came to fulfill them. And it tells us about the work of the Holy Spirit who now takes sinful men and women and makes them sons and daughters of God. And it's all a gift of grace through faith. And friend, the good news is that this offer of salvation, this gift of grace is for you this morning if you'll receive it. The Bible teaches some difficult things about us. The Bible says that we were born sinful and separated from God. We're not not the way we should be, right? We're not living the way we should live. We were supposed to love God and serve him and love others and serve them, but instead sin kind of makes us selfish and turned in on ourselves. And so we are primarily focused on me and myself and I, and it leads us to rebel against God and to reject God, and it leads us to hurt other people as well. And everyone sitting here this morning has done things that we know are wrong, and we know that they're deeply wrong, things that we're ashamed of, things that if they were ever brought to light, we would be very shamed by. All of this is sin, and here's what sin does. Sin brings us under the judgment of a holy God because God is good. He must punish sin. And so left to ourselves, there's no way for us to be good enough for God. There's no way for us to do enough religious deeds to be accepted by God. No, the Bible says if we were to, to die in our sins, unforgiven, we would all perish. There's no hope in ourselves. The Bible tells us there's great hope in this Messiah that we've been talking about in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the one who came to live the kind of life that we could not live. That's why God entered this world to live a perfect life because you and I can't do so. And he did. He always obeyed the will of God. He always loved others precisely the way they needed to be loved. And when the time was right, Jesus laid down his life on the cross. He was fulfilling prophecy. Even prophecies written 700 years before his life, he's perfectly fulfilling these prophecies. He dies and then he rises from the dead. And now the glory of Christianity is that we can offer to you this morning a full and free pardon. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from me as a pastor. No, it comes from God himself. God says, if you will turn from your sins and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, he will forgive you. He will wash you. He will make you clean. He will accept you. That is what the Bible is about. And so, friend, we would invite you to enter into that relationship with God this morning through Jesus Christ. Put your trust in Christ and be saved. If you want to know about that, if you want to talk about that, we would love to talk with you after the service this morning. There's an application for those of us who are following Jesus as well. Like the angels, we should have a burning desire to know the glories of the gospel. It is fascinating to think about the fact that these holy angels who have beheld the the, the glory of God from all of creation, they are fascinated by the cross. They're fascinated by Jesus. Why? Because they see the glory of God displayed in the gospel. They see his glory in his justice and mercy meeting at the cross. You want to see where all of the kind of the disparate attributes of God come together? They come together at the cross. His wrath and his mercy, his justice and his forgiveness his wrath against sin, his love for the sinner, Jesus' willingness to come from heaven to earth so that we might go from earth to heaven, God's resurrection power displayed as Jesus overcomes death and hell. All of these things are seen in the gospel. It's an amazing thing to meditate on, to think on. They do. It's kind of like a diamond, right? If you, you know, we have some newly engaged people and then they get the diamond ring and they're looking at it this way, and they're looking at it that way, and it's beautiful this way, and it's beautiful that way. The gospel's like that. Why? Because you look at it from one perspective, and it's beautiful. God's glory is seen. And then you look at it from another angle, and you see more, and you see more, and you see more. And here's the thing, brothers or sisters, if you're bored with the gospel this morning, the problem isn't the gospel. The problem is my heart and your heart. And we're not captivated the way we should be. And part of the problem is probably this. We're not meditating on it. We're not thinking about it right? 
In the gospel, we have redemption. Think about the fact that we have a greater rescue than Israel did. They were taken out of physical slavery. We have been set free from spiritual bondage to sin and death and hell. In the gospel, we find cleansing, right? All of our sins were on us like stains, but now they have been washed white as snow. In the gospel, we find forgiveness. All of our sins, past, present, and future, as far away from us as the east is from the west, they've been cast by God's grace into a sea of forgetfulness. In the gospel, we experience atonement, at one meant that we have been brought together now, reconciled to God through what Jesus has done. In the gospel, we have hope. Not a dying hope. I hope I make a lot of money and die rich. A living hope. I hope I know, I'm certain, I'm confident that I'm going to live forever in the presence of God, and it has nothing to do with my righteousness. It has everything to do with Jesus who died for me. All of this is seen in the gospel. And what a privilege to meditate on it. Very briefly, a third application. We should remember that the holy angels are still watching. Part of what they're watching, part of what they're seeing is the way the gospel impacts sinful people and takes them from being self-absorbed, little kind of deities of their own, and slowly transforms them to see that actually I'm not the center of the universe. I was made to find delight in God, and I was made to love other people. And so this week, as they're looking at my life and your life, what will they see? Oh, they have the privilege this week, by God's grace, of seeing us love and think and act and speak like Jesus. That's what they, that's what they can see by God's grace. And what a privilege for us to live in that way so that the glory of the gospel would be seen in us. So this morning we've been reminded of the worth of our salvation. We see it in the longings of the Old Testament prophets to understand it. We see it in the longing of the holy angels to understand the glory of God in it. And so we should praise God this morning. We should praise him this morning, and by his grace, we should seek to understand it more and more. And may he help us do that this week. Let's pray. God, we praise you as the holy, righteous God, the one who has set us free. Lord, we praise you this morning for the glory of the gospel, for your wisdom displayed in it that takes broken people like us and is transforming us into the very image of the Son of God, and it's all through grace. And Lord, we would confess this morning that none of us meditates on these truths and thinks about these truths the way that we should. But Lord, we know it's true. And by your spirit, we pray that in this coming week, you would help us meditate more and think more and value more the salvation that you have given us in Christ. And we pray that you would use our lives in this coming week to be an example of your glory to to the lost around us who don't know Jesus and to watching angels who will praise you for it. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, let's stand together as we conclude our service this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be